Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. In my video on the algebraic incarnation of points, we saw how the points manifest themselves purely algebraically in terms of the coordinate ring. What I want to show in this video today is how the topology of the geometry also manifests itself purely algebraically. And I'll do this by introducing something called the Zariski topology. This topology is named after Oscar Zariski, who is one of the founding fathers of the American School of Algebraic Geometry, and incidentally also my supervisor's supervisor. Okay, so to describe it, let me set up the notation that we have. As usual, we'll have F is an algebraically closed field. And we'll use the symbol AN, affine N space, to denote the set of all N tuples. We want to work a little bit more generally than we have done it before and look at sets of polynomials inside this polynomial ring, say, so polynomials in variables x1 up to xn. And in this case here, we can still look at the set of common zeros of all these polynomials, Vs. So that means just all the n tuples alpha, such that f of alpha equals zero for all polynomials f inside s. What I want to do in the next example is just play around with this. How does this behave with respect to changing this s here? Okay, so firstly you can pick just the polynomial x inside the affine plane. So we'd say variables x and y. x equals 0, of course, just gives you the y-axis. y equals 0 just gives you the x-axis. What if we consider both of these? If you, want, if you want both x equals 0 and y equals 0, that means you intersect these two, and you just get the point at the origin. So putting the two together gives you the intersection. Let's suppose we throw a third one in, x plus y, where you can look at the line where x plus y equals 0 and intersect it with that too, but intersecting with that doesn't shrink this point any further. So this variety carved out by x equals 0 and y equals 0 is the same as the zeros of these three polynomials. And let's think more generally about what's going on. The point is that if x and y are already 0, then certainly the sum of these two must be 0 there as well. So imposing the condition that this polynomial be 0 doesn't add any extra conditions here. So to a certain extent, this is superfluous. Okay, so I hope this example suggests some of the facts that I want to tell you about this uh, v of s. So firstly, suppose you increase the size of s. That means that you're asking for zeros of more polynomials, so the only thing that can happen to this variety is it can get smaller. That's the first point. And we see an example where it does actually get smaller, an example where we add something but it stays the same. The second thing is that if you argue as we did here, we'll see that in fact the variety of zeros of some set of polynomials is actually the same as the variety of the set of polynomials in the ideal generated by that subset. Because basically, if you have two functions and you look at the zeros of that, the sum will also be on the uh, zero there. And similarly, you can show that uh, if, it, if you scale and multiply by a polynomial, it doesn't increase your conditions. So that's why you have this equality here. What else is rather nice about this is that, well, this set S can be infinite. So this set S, then, you can replace it with its ideal, which is infinite. But Hilbert's basis theorem says that any ideal in the polynomial ring can be generated by a finite number of elements. So actually, this variety even though it's the zeros of an infinite number of polynomials, 
you can re-express it as the zeros of a finite number of polynomials. Okay, so let's uh, keep going. Suppose you have two ideals in this polynomial ring. You can form a new ideal, ij. And it's going to be basically just sums of products of something in i with something in j. So in other words, you can pick some fi's in i, gi's in j, and you look at the sum of the fi, gi. And it's quite easy to check that this is an ideal. So you can ask, what's the relationship between the variety of zeros of i, j, and the variety of i and b of j? And the answer is, this is just a union of these two. Okay, so let's just pick a simple example where that's true and see why that's the case. Here's a variety where x is 0. This is where y is 0. What's the variety where x, y equals 0? Of course, it's the union of these two. And that's what you see here. Okay, so suppose now you have a whole collection of ideals indexed by gamma inside this capital gamma. Another ideal you can form is the sum of all these ideals. So the elements in here are just sums of elements inside here, of course finite. And it's easy to check that this is an ideal. And the question is, what's the relationship between the variety of this sum and the variety of these individual i gammas? And the answer is, it's just the intersection of all these. And that's something that we saw in this example here. If you intersect the ideal generated by x, this variety here with this one here, you get this here. And that corresponds to the fact that the ideal generated by x, y is just the sum of the ideal generated by x with the ideal generated by y. Okay, so why did I list these properties here? Well, it turns out this is the way that we'll define the Zariski topology on affine n space. To give you the topology, normally, you, of course, you give the open subsets. But here, instead, I'll tell you the closed sets. And the closed sets are just all the varieties, or the v of i. And you might as well just take i to be some ideal in this polynomial ring. So what types of things do you need to check to check that it's a topology? Well, you need to check that finite unions of closed sets are still closed. And we see this here. The union of two closed sets is equal to this variety here, so it's closed. You need to check that arbitrary intersections of closed sets is still closed. And that's what this shows you here. I guess the other thing that you should check is, well, uh, the empty set and the whole set, are they also closed? And it's quite easy that if you pick the ideal to be either zero or the whole polynomial ring, you'll get those two answers. So this gives you the Zariski topology on A to N. And then you can ask, well, what about any variety V of S? Well, this is just a subset of this. So you can just look at the subspace topology and that gives you the Zariski topology on this V of S. Okay, so let's recall from my video on algebraic incarnation of points that the points in affine n space can be expressed algebraically in terms of the coordinate ring, the polynomial ring in n variables. In fact, the points are in bijective correspondence with just the maximal ideals in this ring. So the other question you might want to ask is, can you characterize the Zariski topology completely algebraically as well? The answer has to be, of course, yes. And the answer is actually quite nice too. So the closed set that corresponds to the variety of the ideal i, that's some subset of this. So it should correspond to some subset of maximal ideals. And which maximal ideals are those? They're just the maximal ideals which happen to contain i. So that's the most natural thing that you can think of, and that's the answer. And if you just go through this correspondence, you can easily check that this is indeed true. 
Okay, so let's have a little look at an example of the Zariski topology. And the simplest situation we can look at is the affine line. And let's look over the complex numbers. To work out its topology, we just work out all the closed sets V of I. So what does an ideal I of the polynomial ring Cx look like? Well, this is a principal ideal domain, so it's just generated by one polynomial f. So the variety of this i is just the variety of the zeros of f. And this is just a single polynomial, so it's just some finite set of roots. So conversely, any finite subset of C is actually closed. It's actually of this form, in other words. Why is that? If you have a finite set of points, you can make a polynomial with that finite set as its set of roots. And so that polynomial F gives you a description of that finite set as V of F, this closed set. So that's rather nice that the upshot of this little argument here, which is quite simple, is that we have a complete characterization of the Zariski topology on A1, and it's just a cofinite topology. Closed sets are just finite sets of roots, or, or in other words, finite sets of complex numbers, and of course the only one which is not finite is the whole set itself. Okay, well, let's have a look in this case, I picked the complex numbers for a reason, and that's because the affine line, you can think of it in terms of the complex plane, and the complex plane has its own usual Euclidean topology. You can have a little open set like this, which is the open disk. And when you think about it, this is not the complement of a finite set of points. So this is not Zariski open. So the warning that you need to bear in mind here is the Zariski topology is actually a lot coarser than the Euclidean topology. Certainly if you have the complement of a finite set of points, that's going to be open in the Euclidean topology. But as you see here, the converse doesn't hold true at all. And in fact, this has a much more unfortunate consequence. And that is that all curves are actually homeomorphic. In fact, you can show that for curves, you have a similar description of the Zariski topology. It's just a cofinite topology. And for curves, it's also true that they have the same cardinality. So if you have the same cardinality as sets, and you have the cofinite topology, they have to be homeomorphic. So that's a very, very unfortunate consequence. And what's one of the reasons why this is happening? Well, the point is that the Zariski topology is defined over any field. And if it's defined in this level of generality, you expect that, well, maybe when you specialize to special fields like the complex numbers, you could have different behavior coming through. So in particular, it works for the field, which is the algebraic closure of a finite field. It works for the algebraic closure of the rationals. And then, of course, you can't expect in such situations that you have an equivalent formulation of the Euclidean topology. So the Zariski topology is one that we have. It's very nice. And it happens fairly generally, but it doesn't recover the Euclidean topology. And what about this unfortunate consequence here, that all curves are homeomorphic? So what's going on? The point is that the topology doesn't capture all the geometry of varieties. There's more geometry than just the topological space. So if you want to define what is the geometric structure there, there's more than just the topology. And what is that? Well, strangely enough, that extra geometry is encoded in the algebra of the coordinate ring. It's actually the ring structure of that coordinate ring. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.